All right. Welcome everyone to our supporting law enforcement summit. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and hop into some resources. For a bit of an introduction, my name is Elizabeth and I serve as NAMI Westside LA's program director. We're going to start today's summit with some NAMI resources. Even if you're outside of the west side of Los Angeles, these NAMI resources are all across the country because we have over 600 affiliates. And they're really wonderful to share with community members, but also utilize yourself if you're interested. So all of us on here, Jalissa, myself, and Oshri, all three presenters, we come from NAMI Westside LA staff, and we're one of three affiliates in the LA area. So there's also NAMI Urban Los Angeles and NAMI Greater Los Angeles County. At NAMI, we provide free education, support, and advocacy to improve the lives of those living with mental health conditions, as well as their family and friends, mental health professional, and all of those who share NAMI's vision and mission. This slide is a bit of an overview of everything we offer, and then I'm gonna dive into each one in a bit more detail. But as you can see on the left, we have support groups in both English and Spanish, peer and family classes, school presentations, speaker series, we have a warm line and outreach services and also an undergraduate intern program. On the right, you can see our lovely staff. And uh, it's for me having joined NAMI Westside LA in 2018 when we were a team of three staff, watching it grow to be what we are today has been incredible. And a huge part of that is the funding that we receive both public and private. And actually what was allowing us to do our work with law enforcement and put on things like this summit is a grant that we got from CIT. Hopping into our support groups. So this is what you think of when you think of a general support group, but it's led by folks with lived experience, which means it's led by family members who have a loved one with a mental health condition and peers who live with a mental health condition themselves. When they're in this role, they're coming from a place of, I've been there too. And so even though some of these folks might work in the mental health space during their day job, when they come to our support groups as leaders, they're here as family members and as peer support group leaders trained in NAMI's model of facilitation. All of our support groups can be found on our website. And as you can see, we run four family support groups a week and we have five of the peer support groups a week. One addition that we've made over the last year and a half is we also offer support groups on the inpatient unit over at UCLA. And so there's a lot of ways we can get creative with how we bring services to our community. We're really trying to meet the community where they're at. Our family classes and our peer classes are a free eight week educational program that allows a cohort of 15 students, in the case of family members, to learn about how to support their loved one with a mental health condition and for peers, how to support their own mental health. Every class builds upon each other and gives some tangible tools, whether it's how to partner with healthcare providers, a deep dive into brain biology and medication, or communication skills. Each class, we really want students to walk away with tangible skills and resources. Our Ending the Silence presentation is a free one-hour presentation for middle and high school students. Oshri, who's on the call with us, actually just came from one today. And now that the school year is starting, we get so many requests from our local middle and high schools to come give this presentation and start the conversation about mental health early. We also have our undergraduate internship program. These lovely folks on our right are some of our UCLA interns. And they, in their time in their undergraduate career, have the opportunity to get course credit by volunteering at community orgs like ourselves and gain real life experience outside the classroom. All of them wanna be in the mental health space in some capacity after graduation, but may not have considered the nonprofit sector. And so this gives them that real life experience to really see if it's a good fit for them. In our time last quarter, we were actually able to have some of our UCLA undergraduate interns go table at UCPD and bring resources both to the staff there and to community members. So that was a really wonderful experience for them. 
Here is our Janice Black Warner speaker series. On the left, you can see Janice Black Warner. She's the wonderful donor who allows this event to happen. On the first Wednesday of every month, we bring in an expert in the space, whether it's a mental health professional, mental health advocate, therapist, authors, to really talk and deep dive into a topic. Um, and then we also post it on our YouTube channel. You can see the archive on the right. So if there's anything you're interested in, any topic you're interested in, be sure to check out our YouTube channel and look at our past speakers. And this, for example, will be on our YouTube channel as well. Our warm line and outreach services really were able to take off thanks to the support of the Cal Hope Grant throughout the pandemic. This allowed us to expand our warm line to include both an English and a Spanish service. When I say warm line, the reason it's called warm line is it operates during office hours and it's not a hotline. It's not for crisis management. It's really for resource navigation and to have a place for callers to talk to someone, feel less alone. The pandemic was incredibly isolating and so it created a space to get mental health support as well. On the screen, you can see a lot of our lovely outreach workers. You might've seen us out in the community. We go to farmer's markets, college campuses, anywhere that would really like our resources. And like I said, we were over at UCPD in the uh, winter and spring quarters. <laughs> Here on the screen is the information for both our English and our Spanish warm line, as well as our office line. You can also find out more about our services at our website, namiwla.org. And if you're tuning in from outside of the west side of Los Angeles, you can just look up the NAMIs near you. You could type in your area in NAMI, or you could go to NAMI National, and there's a find your affiliate option because there is a local affiliate doing this work by you. And we really want to partner with law enforcement agencies to best serve the mental health of our community. Now for what we're getting into today, we're going to be doing a NAMI signature program called Sharing Your Story with Law Enforcement. It's often referred to as CECL, the acronym. And so CECL presenters share their lived experience living with a mental health condition or supporting a family member with a mental health condition who have interacted with the law enforcement in some capacity and now continue to live well with their mental illness or support their loved one with their mental illness. We really at NAMI aim to break down stigma by sharing stories. And we hope that hearing from folks who have had interactions with law enforcement while in a mental health crisis will help provide some understanding and a new perspective. Oftentimes, CECLs are shared at CIT trainings, and NAMI's goal is to really ensure that if officers want to hear the story of folks with mental health conditions, we'll provide the space for that. So tonight, we're doing it at a summit. We can go to staff meetings, really anywhere where you would like some mental health resources and stories presented. But like I said, most commonly found in CIT trainings. So without further ado, I will pass it to you, Jalissa, to start off with your CECL presentation. Thanks, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and as you, as she mentioned, this is typically part of CIT or a crisis intervention training program that, that officers might attend or go through. However, many law enforcement agencies don't have that um, availability or option. And NAMI as a national organization is really looking to make sure that all law enforcement agencies that are interested in learning about supporting or becoming allies for, um, for those in the mental health community do have this information available. Many of us that live with mental illnesses have family members or loved ones that live with mental illnesses or substance use have interactions with law enforcement. Um, for myself, the uh, my first interaction with law enforcement actually came when I was seven years old. I was removed from school. Two plainclothes police officers showed up at my elementary school. They called me into the principal's office and explained that I would be uh, leaving school campus with the officers and they took me home and at seven years old I um, I didn't know that the things that were happening in my home were illegal or abusive or wrong I just knew that's where I lived and uh, I didn't hear much I didn't understand much at seven I overheard the officers telling my mom if you don't let them leave with us now you might never see them again 
and I had never been away from my parents. I never spent the night somewhere else. And um, my first experience was, was this, was being removed by police and not knowing if I was going to come back. After that, um, we did end up going back home, but home was never the same. My parents got divorced. Um, my mom, who was a single mom then and had no real work experience, we were sort of plunged into poverty. And the system appeared very broken from my seven-year-old eyes, that my, my abusive father continued his life without a hiccup, and my sisters and I really suffered. Um, after that, going into elementary school, junior high years, there were more options court ordered therapy because of things that were happening at home. Um, police were called to my home a number of times because after my mom remarried, my my stepdad was uh, was a Vietnam veteran with PTSD and, uh, and a substance use issue. And from that, I witnessed domestic violence. We had police called to our home repeatedly, whether for my sisters, whether for myself, um, the anger levels and the the level of emotion just always seemed to rise to a place where we needed kind of someone else to come in and help us to navigate these things. Moving into, you know, high school and beyond, um, one of the things that really sticks out to me as kind of a warning sign, I got five speeding tickets in the first year that I got my driver's license. I just did not care what happened. I was just like, always out there looking to get in trouble, looking to put myself in trouble, looking to to kind of um, what I eventually realized was end my life in a way that wasn't specific or exactly suicide. I had had an interaction with a drug um, that was prescribed by a doctor when I was 16 and my throat closed and I almost died. So suicide as an option was taken away from me. I realized that death was forever. I realized that I couldn't just go and take my own life. But if I made really bad decisions, if I put myself in situations and that ended up with me dying, then that's not suicide. That's just when I, that's just my time to go. That's just, you know, my time. And for the next three years from the age of um, 24, really to 27, I was putting myself in every situation possible. I was arrested a number of times. I would continue to get arrested and not fulfill any of the things necessary to take care of that issue. Um, and each time it was just worse and worse and worse, obviously. You know, the charges become more, the failures to appear rack up and, and none of that mattered to me until finally one time I got arrested and I realized, what if I never die? What if I just keep getting arrested, going to jail, not having a place to live, not having a future, and just keep going down and down and down and down? Because I'm seeing already my life going down and down and down, and it's not changing. Nothing's changing. Nothing's getting better. It took, um, it took being in jail uh, for a couple of weeks for realizing that and also realizing that, um, you know, there are other options out there. There were things that happened to me in those last few, um, few weeks of really being involved in my mental illness and my substance use disorder to really understand that, um, God will let you continue on this path if you want, but there are options and there are ways to kind of change this. And for the first time in my life, some of the things that I had heard throughout those interactions, some of those things police had said to me, some of those things that therapists had said to me, some of those things that were said to me in 12-step groups kind of crystallized and I realized I could make a change. There's a possibility to make a change here. Through that awareness and through those meetings, through coming to find out about programs like NAMI and the education that's out there, I slowly began to realize that I didn't have to live this way anymore. That I could see a difference not only in myself, but maybe for my son or maybe for my sister, because my story, like many stories, is not just about me. 
as I mentioned, I have a, a, a I had a father who's now gone who has a di had a diagnosis of PTSD. I have a sister that has a diagnosis of bipolar. I have another sister that is gone now from opioid addiction and an opioid overdose. All of these things connect. Um, I was just talking to someone and it was like mental illness, substance use, law enforcement. These things all track around each other, of across each other, intertwine with each other. And the more that we all as advocates, as allies, as parents, as law enforcement can come together to understand the way these things crisscross, to support each other with information and education so that I'm not afraid to call law enforcement when my family member or myself needs it. And law enforcement is not afraid to show up to a mental health call or a situation where someone is like, oh, my, my family member is struggling and appearing violent, but please don't shoot them or please don't, you know, please don't do those other things that we sometimes hear about. So I feel like the more we have these conversations and better understand the ways to support each other, the ways to to better these interactions and um, and have these outcomes appear better, not only for ourselves and our loved ones, but for law enforcement to be able to share these things as wins in the community and say, hey, look, at, we're taking these trainings and we're doing these things with our officers so that we can combat some of that negative press and, and negative talk that goes out there about, about some of the agencies and, and officers, because I know not only from my personal experience, but from my from my brother-in-law, who's a law enforcement officer, and from my work with law enforcement agencies, that you all do care very deeply about the people that you're working to support and working to protect and working to serve. And there is so much more information now that we have for for where these things come from and how to better support and understand um, why people react the way they do around law enforcement. One of the most exciting things that I'm learning about right now and, and really excited to share is, um, is about polyvagal theory and the vagus nerve and the way that our body and our systems react to stressful situations. Highly important for us, especially to understand that Anytime I feel like someone is involved with a law enforcement officer, their stress, their emotion, their cortisol levels, that all rises. And for some folks, that's going to get to a point where they are no longer able to access the front of their brain where they're making good decisions. For some folks, that's going to put them in a place where they're not able to hear or understand commands that are given, where they're going to have reactions to things that... Um, many law enforcement officers are trained to understand or trained to not have those reactions, but people on the street are not trained for that. So how do we make sure that the folks that are trained understand that the folks that they're meeting maybe need a little bit more patience, a little bit more understanding, a little bit more explanation, or even just a little bit more quiet to understand what is being asked of them. Many of our loved ones are on the autism spectrum. They are dealing with auditory hallucinations. They are dealing with other situations and experiences that are not typical for, for most folks. And when you expect someone to react or behave in a way that is typical, when their experience is anything but typical, that's where we get some of these conflicts. That's where we get some of these issues. I know for myself, there were many times where I was almost literally and completely out of my mind. I look back at the decisions I made, things that I did to myself and to my loved ones, thinking this is the best possible decision for myself and coming to a realization after that, oh my goodness, I had no idea what I was doing. One of the most significant kind of aha moments for me, and it came much later was, we had uh, we had gotten our apartment broken into. We we I was living with a with a with a girlfriend of mine, and we had gone away with our, to be quite honest, with our drug dealer for a weekend in Vegas. And when we came back, our apartment was broken into, and we had to call the police because some watches were stolen. That all seems like somewhat normal. I mean, except for the drug dealer in Vegas situation, but that might that might also be normal for some folks here in LA. 
But when we came back and we realized that we needed to call the police, the person I was with, she didn't have the legal issues I did. She wanted to call the police. Me, I knew there was a warrant for my arrest. If the police are called and they find out who I am, I'm going to jail. So my best thinking, my best decision was I walked outside of that apartment and I went into her car and I sat in her car with the doors locked and the windows rolled up for hours waiting for law enforcement to show up for a breaking and entering that um, that had happened we don't know when. And typically when I tell this story to law enforcement officers, they understand that those phone calls do not get answered very quickly. <laughs> and I was going to be waiting quite a while in that car. It was September in Los Angeles. When we called the police, it was 10 o'clock in the morning and I was wearing a sweatshirt and corduroy jeans. And I went to the car and I locked myself in the car and I sat there sweating and I couldn't breathe. And I was so afraid to open the door, to even let my girlfriend know where I was. Even though she knew that I had her car keys, I was so afraid. And I would sit there sweating, unable to breathe until I just couldn't take it anymore. And I would crack the door open and I would breathe through that crack for a little while. And then I would close the door again and wait. That is the best that my mind could come up with at that moment. That is not the best that I'm capable of. That is not the best of who I am, but that is all that I could do in that moment. If, if anything can be grasped from these stories, it's the understanding that what you are seeing is not the best that that person has to offer. That they are struggling in a way that they don't even recognize. And that there is a person in there that has potential, that has abilities, that can do something with their life. And I have seen that story over and over and over again, not just with myself, but with other people that we work with that have come from situations that were far worse than mine and become something so much more. But what you see in those moments of terror and fear and, and emotional overwhelm and nervous system triggering is not who that person is. And it's not all that they are. And so for me to then look back and see like, oh my gosh, I, that's all, that's, that's, that's all I could do at that moment. And and now I get to look and see like how much I've learned, how much I've changed, how much I've grown, how much of an impact NAMI has had on my life and the lives of people around me to really understand that like recovery is possible. It is possible for everyone. It does not look the same for everyone. It does not mean that everyone has the same level, but it is possible for everyone to gain recovery, to have a sense of self, a sense of community, a sense of purpose. I believe that is possible for everyone. Um, I highly invite everyone to come and join. We are having a conference. <laughs> NAMI California is having a conference in October at the Anaheim in Anaheim, I think at the Marriott Convention Center. And, um, and I will be doing a presentation on polyvagal theory at the conference if you'd like more information on this. Um, but we welcome law enforcement to come to the conference and, and meet with folks and talk to folks. And here's some of the other workshops that are gonna be presented. And those of you that are the allies within uh, within the law enforcement agencies, please share this information with, with friends, with teams, with family members, with, with anyone in the community so that we can become those connectors to let people know who we are, how we support each other, how we can work together to really make sure that no one falls through the cracks anymore. And I probably have more time, but I'm going to stop just because I'm getting a little <laughs> overwhelmed. <laughs> Jalissa, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's so incredibly powerful to hear. Yeah, please do what you need to. And I'm just so grateful for all of us on this call today, taking the time to talk about mental health. And um, I'm going to be sharing my story as well. And my experience living with mental health conditions, but I'll do a little bit of an intro. Like I said at the beginning, my name is Elizabeth. I grew up in SoCal down in Orange County, and then I moved up to Los Angeles for college. I had 
grown up in a very small town with a very small school. And then I came up to Los Angeles, huge, huge city, huge college. And it was, it was a lot and it was very overwhelming, but I also found a community there. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail as I share my story. Now I've been working at NAMI Westside LA since 2018. And then I moved into the role of program director and I'm really grateful to be able to talk in schools here with law enforcement really openly about my own story because I know for me that would have really helped break down a lot of the stigma that I experienced growing up. For me, mental health conditions ran strongly through the family and as a kid I didn't understand that but looking back now it's so obvious. Um, growing up, my dad struggled with really severe depression and substance use that really affected every part of family life. It affected him holding down a job. It led to interactions with law enforcement. It really just also wasn't talked about. It was just like, that's the way it is. And we're going to keep chugging along. And I know that when I first started exhibiting signs of mental health conditions in late middle school, early high school, I have a lot of empathy for my mom, who was probably seeing the signs play out, but in her daughter. And my first experience with my mental health condition was actually in the form of a panic attack. I had no idea what was happening. I was 14 and I couldn't catch my breath. My heart was racing. Um, and I was telling my mom, I was like, I think I'm, I think I'm dying. And that's a really common experience with panic attacks now that I've talked to a lot of other folks who live with them. But at the time, I had no idea what was happening in my body. And uh, my mom took me to the hospital because she was like, oh my gosh, something's seriously wrong. And I only described my physical symptoms to the first responders. And I was given an inhaler because I was only describing like the breathing issues. I wasn't describing any of the thoughts, any of the other experiences that only I would have known about. And so in the next couple of weeks when I had my next panic attack, I used the inhaler, didn't do anything. And so I figured, well, something's wrong with me. Like I need to figure this out. And I didn't want to talk about it because no one else, I, I didn't see anyone else going through this. I figured this was like a personal flaw of mine. And that just kind of became my MO when I moved into depression and when I moved into other symptoms of my mental illness in the future is like, let's hide this, let's not talk about it. And looking back now, it makes a lot of sense because I was modeled in my family unit. And so when I made it to college, I really had a lot to kind of unpack there, but instead I just got better at hiding it. I'm really lucky that I did find a really good group of friends who really openly talked about their mental health. And I related a lot to the struggles they were sharing. And they talked about going to CAPS, which is the counseling center on campus. They talked about the services they were, they were receiving. I happened to take a psychology class. A lot of things, because I was in this environment of higher education, allowed me to have my mental health story look a lot different than it could have. And I had a lot of supports in place that allowed me to receive help and so during my time of undergrad, I went through periods of depression, I went through periods of anxiety, but nothing that I couldn't kind of just muster through and find support in other avenues. And I also, as my job at the time, was a resident assistant, so an RA, and oftentimes that person on the floor is the person that the students go to in a time of mental health crisis. And so for me, when in my experience with mental health crises, if someone had experienced suicidal ideation and disclosed that they couldn't keep themselves safe, it was our policy to call UCPD and have them come be assessed for a 5150. And that's what we were trained to do. But then seeing it actually play out in real life, we had a crisis on our floor where someone did attempt suicide and we had to call UCPD and go through all of the steps that happened. That person ended up being okay, but it was a traumatic event for the entire floor and for the staff as well. And at the time, I, I didn't understand what was happening on the police end of things because there's a very particular 
protocol that had to be followed, including handcuffs and taking the person away in the car. And my 19 year old brain was like, I, they didn't do anything wrong. Like why is law enforcement the responder for this situation? I didn't understand the handcuffs. I had a lot of questions, but in the moment of crisis, it was also just about following protocol myself and trying to be there for the other students. And I didn't look at it very deeply at the time. But my junior year, I was facing a really low episode of depression where I was experiencing suicidal ideation. And I had created a plan to take my life. And I was very serious about it. Um, I knew when, I knew how, and I really stopped all other aspects of my life. I wasn't showing up to class. I wasn't showing up to work. I was flaking on friends. I just had kind of checked out. So I wasn't showing up in any way, shape or form. And my best friend was like, okay, like something is seriously wrong. And she showed up to my dorm and clearly saw I was not taking care of myself. And she asked that question of if I was contemplating suicide. And I decided to be honest because it was a really dark, scary place in my head. And I wouldn't be here if I hadn't disclosed that. And she took me down to CAPS, the counseling center on campus, where I was evaluated by a psychologist and deemed to be put on a 5150. And so now I was on the other side of the equation that I had seen play out in a really difficult, traumatic situation. And I was so ashamed to be on the other side of it. I hadn't really faced a lot of my own internalized stigma around mental health. And this was kind of a deep dive into acute mental health care in a crisis. And at CAPS on campus, uh, UCPD isn't that far away. And so the officers came rather quickly and responded quickly to the situation. And I remember being so nervous because the therapist had prepped me like they will use handcuffs, like I'll advocate to not use handcuffs. But the officer that came on the scene um, had kind of a dialogue with the therapist and the therapist was like, she's not, she's not a danger like to hurt anyone. Like she really doesn't need the handcuffs. But the officer very like clearly explained that it's, it's protocol. Like we have to go about it this way. And I remember being led out of the counseling building on the path that I would normally take to class to the car, uh, the police car. And I still remember like the very, very visceral experience of shame and getting into the back seat and absolutely like ducking down because I was like, I'm gonna see people, I'm gonna lose my job. Like the RA job is how I was affording to live in Los Angeles. I also didn't care to be there like on earth. So I was like, this is really not going well for me. And the I do so appreciate the interactions I had with the officer because this was 2017 and I still remember the small talk he made with me in the back seat because I had a Orange County cross-country shirt like old ratty depression shirt um and I he was just like small talk about cross-country in Orange County and I was like my I'm, I just don't want to be here but I still was like I've I appreciated that he still very treat very much treated me like a human and like I said by being in college by having student health insurance so many things went right for me to get the help I did and in the waiting room, he stayed with me the whole time. I will say he had to go use the restroom and I escaped. I did run out at the hospital. I did leave. <laughs> so I, I, I don't think I was an ideal patient or person to be watching over. But even then, he was very nice to me. <laughs> like, even though I had escaped, I was like, all right, I'm out of here. Um, and stayed with me the entire time waiting to go upstairs to get a bed. And without that experience... I would not be here now. It was by no means the only time I've been hospitalized. I actually live with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. I have had times of mania. I've had times of depression. And this time, however, was my one time with law enforcement because I was very unwilling to go get help. And so that's when the 5150 process came into play. And I know for me now, giving this presentation, looking back on the students who I know got placed on a 5150 during my time as an RA and just in my own time being 5150, I can only imagine how difficult it was on the other side of it to have to follow the protocol we did. But I am, without everyone who took part in it, 
I wouldn't have gotten on medication. I wouldn't have gotten therapy. I wouldn't be here with NAMI right now. And after I left the hospital, I found a therapist. I found a psychiatrist. I found so many things that do work for me. And I also found a community at NAMI where in my senior year of college, I took some time off school and then came back. And I led peer support groups, led peer classes, and really tried to learn how I would communicate my story with others to try to destigmatize mental health. Because I think a lot of this intervention and early intervention work that we do with younger students especially, I could have gotten help a lot earlier than I did. And in retrospect, I got help very early. Like I'm still someone who got help very, very early in their mental health journey. I think it's important to note that so many people go decade plus living with symptoms and having to turn to self-medicating in the form of substance use. There's so many things that happen. I look at my own dad, I know that's what was happening there. Like I can see how many untreated things led to interactions with law enforcement and how really like the intervention I got when I did was still early intervention and in a point of crisis. So I really want to thank everyone for being here tonight, taking the time out of your very busy schedule to listen to our stories, to learn more about mental health. And like I said, we'll be posting this on our YouTube. So if you want to share with anyone or if you want to request any presentations, we are available and able to give these both in person on Zoom. But thank you all for being here tonight. I just have to say, I think it's really funny that you are the bad prisoner because, because like I am the I'm like the the bad the rest. And, and I'm usually like a really great prisoner. Like I'm very honest. I'm like, oh, this is what I was doing. I was speeding. I was doing this. Like, sure, I'll be arrested, no problem. <laughs> But the rest of my life choices were definitely, definitely not along the right track. So I, I applaud you, Elizabeth, for saving <laughs> your, for saving your your bad behavior only for trying to escape. Yeah, no, my friends after that because they heard that I had made an escape, they were like, "You only pay attention to rules when it doesn't really matter, and then when you really needed to, you did just go against them." So I, I, I got a lot of shade for for what you're describing, Jalissa. <laughs> I love it. It's, it's, we're like perfectly yeah. matched. We're yin and yang over here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I want to also open up because Jolisa shared so much of her story. I shared some of my story. If anyone has any questions, want to open the floor to that before we move to the mindfulness section. All right. Well, Oshri, we're going to go ahead and close out with your mindfulness exercise. Perfect. Thank you. And wow, thank you, Jalissa and Elizabeth, for sharing your stories. We've been all working together for about a year and a half now, and I I didn't know this all about you two. So this is really a privilege to, to hear these stories, and they're powerful. And um, we're going to do a little guided meditation on connection. So we're going to work with our body and breathing patterns i find you know when i i also teach mindfulness with kids and there's a little um it was a a second grader who asked me a couple of years ago you know why do we don't we breathe all the time why are we focusing on our breathing like we're we're always breathing and it kind of put me on the spot and the answer to that uh, that i shared was um Well, we're always breathing, right? If we're lucky, we have two working lungs. That's our autonomic nervous system. But what happens in times of stress is that we have the survival response, right? And we tend to breathe more shallow. When we're breathing shallow, we're not oxygenating our brain as much as we can. So certain parts of the fuel tank don't get any juice, Right. So, you know, like the prefrontal cortex, right? the part of our brain that's involved in making good, steady decisions. You know, there's that survival part. And the thing is, it, we don't have the stress can compound. Right. So if you have a stressful job, like, you know, if 
you're taking calls as an officer. I imagine you're dealing with not just your own stress of taking the calls, but then other people's stress compounded onto that. So the way only the one of the best ways I know to then tap into okay, how to how to mitigate that stress and have some uh, some relief and be able to change course, um, even if it's like for your own health, um, is slowing the breath down, right? We can't, I mean, I've heard some people can change their heart rate on, I don't know, <laughs> take a little more practice. I don't really have that on a push button kind of thing. But most of us, when we bring our awareness to it, we can affect our uh, the the rate and depth of our breathing. So I'm going to do a little guided meditation. I worked with around um, around building connection. There'll be a little visualization. So uh, if you're sitting in a chair, um, you can have both feet flat on the ground. If you're sitting any other way, you can have your tailbone kind of rooted into the ground, and you can close your eyes. And you're focusing on your breathing through your nose. And if that's uncomfortable at all, then breathe through your mouth. No problem at all. And you're observing your breath coming in through your nose and or mouth and all the way through your trachea, right? Your throat down and through your chest and into the bottom of your lungs. Right? So focusing all the way to the bottom of your belly. So you'll let your belly expand when you're full of the inhale and then starting opposite way out from the bottom of the belly up when you're exhaling. And exhaling slow. Count, you know, choose a number that's slightly uncomfortable in terms of extenuating the breath. So it could be, you know, if you're if you're watching and your natural breath right now wants to be like three or four seconds, make it five. Just slightly, I wouldn't even say uncomfortable, but challenge yourself to extend that length of the breath a little more. Right. This is something you can practice anytime, right? Even even driving, you know, you're not gonna close your eyes, of course, but you can slow your breath down and you'll have your feet on the gas or the brakes, but, right? Slowing that breath down, you can do it while you're walking, you can do it in conversation. Right? I find it very helpful Right, to be aware of was is the cadence of my speech breathful? Right? Am I allowing pause of breath? And that pause of breath is two things. It's oxygenating my brain. So I'm making you know as good decisions as I can from a place of steadiness and bringing calm to the situation. So think of resonating with this calm. This resonant regulating my own system. And then the way people are, when we hear someone speaking calmly, right, it calms our nervous system. We might not even be aware of why it's happening, but we hear that we're affected by cadence, rhythm, pause, and space. And as you continue to breathe slowly and deeply, let's bring our awareness to the bottom of our feet on the ground. And we're visualizing roots from our feet coming through, whether we're sitting in a car or an apartment or an office space, wherever we are. We're imagining roots coming down into the earth 
from our feet. Continuing to breathe slowly and deeply. And we can practice visualizing and imagining a space deep enough that our roots go, that they all meet somewhere. There's even some place deep enough that we can't even tell who is who, who is me and who is you, right? So that I find is really helpful for helping develop a calm kind of presence before even, you know, if I'm feeling nervous and I'm sitting with someone across the table from me, or even on a Zoom, wherever it is, or from approaching someone, to imagine that and visualize the steadiness of my feet and these roots that come down. And roots come down from their feet as well. And they meet somewhere and we're connected. And the, at the deepest level, we're connected. And I find that really also helps relax the space, right? Because it's so easy, right? I mean, we listened to these stories of, of real challenge. And so, right, stepping into someone's life story, which is what we're doing whenever we meet someone on Zoom or in person or on the phone, we're stepping into each other's life stories. So having an anchor, and sometimes we sometimes it's a friend or a family member and we're in good rapport. We don't really need to remember. We feel that connection without even thinking about it. But what about when we're not feeling it? Is there anything we can do with our breath in our mind's eye to cultivate that sense of connection to say just to let our let our body know instead of, you know, there's this alternative to going into that, that flight or fight or freeze response, the alternative of like, we're connected here. Well, let me, let me sit in that for a moment. Let that awareness of that affect my words, my actions, etc. So we'll take another minute just to, Kind of take it as to allow it as a habit to come in. Oh, even if we commit one day in the next week, I will remember this in one interaction. I'll remember to feel into my roots and to remember the other person's roots, especially when I'm not sensing the, the roots, the common roots at first. Just breathing slowly, deeply. Seeing if you can deepen the inhale and also make the exhale even more complete. So that release is also more complete. Another 30, 40 seconds or so. Take a deep inhale together. And let that go.
And when you're ready, you can open your eyes and come back. Thanks for letting me share that with you. Thank you so much, Oshri. What beautiful imagery of the roots. Oh, Debbie, I love the hearts. I especially was... like the reminder of feeling connected to those we're closest with naturally and like bringing that with us to other folks <laughs> that we're not maybe feeling like that so naturally with. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Well, thank you everyone for sharing this hour with us. I'm going to go ahead and drop my email, Jalissa's email, and Oshri's email in the chat. We all work for NAMI Westside LA. So if you have any questions or would like any programming, we would be more than happy to talk. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. I did uh, mention the mental health toolbox in the chat. And so I we... Oh, we will definitely share that with Elizabeth and, and Larry um, so that they can have that as part of their resources to share with families uh, when they're out on, in the field. Awesome. I'll send you the latest version of that right now, Elizabeth, just so you can pass it along. Thank you, Oshri. All right. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth, for putting this on. Thank you all for being here. We appreciate you. Thank you for inviting us. Bye, everybody. Bye.